I understand we'll have, uh, you can stop me anytime. Uh, when, I, when I get boring, just, you know, do something. Like, like ch ch yeah, hello, yeah, uh, yes, my friend, Chester. <laughs> now, now, that's the humor that hurts. <laughs> See, that, I, I, I understand that kind of, that's called sarcasm. Yeah, and it's wounding. It just should not be. But okay, you know, I thought we were going to be friends tonight, but <laughs> I, it looks Our like. Friends, can't friends joke? That one's been like Yeah, exactly. That, <laughs> yeah, friends building. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks for the assist. He almost, he almost had me there. Uh, maybe. Maybe the best way to introduce this topic, uh, I'm pro there's no way that we're going to be able to cover uh, the vast infinity that is culture and a study of culture in the, in the course of an evening. So let me just put it this way. Uh, I'm willing to answer any, I'm going to leave plenty of time after for you to ask any questions that you want, whether it has to do with biblical culture or how you distinguish certain passages in the Bible, how, how do you know that they're for just that time or for all time, you know, questions like that often come up, uh, and that's, that's a worthwhile question to answer. I just want to begin with a little story to tell you why I'm interested in the whole subject of culture to begin with. Uh, when I was uh, nine years old, uh, my mom, came, I distinctly remember, I was, lived in Benton Harbor, Michigan. My mom came up to me and she said, Paul, uh, what do you think about living in Africa? And I thought, yeah, that's cool. You know, I saw some Tarzan movies on TV. I, I, I kind of thought, you know, th this, is, this, this is doable. You know, I could imagine myself running down jungle paths and pulling bananas off trees and my faithful companion, Cheetah, at my side, you know, learning all interesting languages and things like that. You know, stuff like that. Uh, and so I said, great, let's go to Africa. And then I remember what it was like when the plane first landed on the tarmac in Lusaka. It was a VC-10. It had four jets in the back on the tail, and uh, it was one of the first major jets that they were flying in Africa. A really short little runway. I remember looking out the window at this alien environment that the heat was shimmering off the tarmac in a way that I'd just never seen the heat shimmer. And these flat top trees, acacia trees, just looked so weird, you know, like what you see in the... The, the, the movies on the Serengeti and stuff like that, this, this yellow grass, like a shock of hair sprouting out here and there. And I suddenly realized, this is it. I'm home. First weeks in school. At that time, uh, Zambia was a uh, British colony it's called Northern Rhodesia. And the Brits were still in charge of pretty much everything. And uh, I, I remember my recesses. They called them breaks there. They weren't recess. Uh, all of a sudden being surrounded. Did you ever see a picture of an antelope getting run down by a lion? You know, they, they sort of cull out the weak one of the herd, the straggler. And then <laughs> they just know. <laughs> They're just going to go for that guy. <laughs> so that, that's, that's, that's kind of how it was. Um, I had a buzz cut, uh, sort of like my enemy, uh, my, my, my good friend, Chester. <laughs> uh, and um, I, I look, because in those days, the Brits all had longer hair, so it was, it was just sort of weird. I mean, you were spotted out just, just how you looked, and my clothes, my uniform, I didn't know how to tie a tie properly, and my socks were improperly disheveled. I mean, there was a proper dishevelment and an improper dishevelment, and I was never quite able to figure that out. Uh, so I remember being beaten up. Uh, and when I asked them why, they said, because the U.S., didn't enter into the Battle of Britain until two years after 
Hitler began bombing uh, England. So this is 1962. Hitler and all that stuff, that was like 1939, 1942. Had a hard time figuring out why I was responsible for that, you know. I hadn't even been born then, but you know, it just didn't make sense to me. That was my introduction to a different culture. So before anybody began to talk about diversity or culture or cultural studies or anything like that, I was already experiencing what it was like to grow up in a culture that was not your own, and somehow you had to figure out how to play the game in this new place where the rules were entirely different, and all the people there knew how to play the game, and you knew how to play the game back in the States, only you didn't realize it was a game, and they didn't realize a game, but now you're in a place where you got to figure out what the rules are, and there's no rule book. There's no monopoly. Nobody's handing out any rules. You just got to kind of figure it out by osmosis, okay? And after I got older, I began to realize a few things about that early event in my life. Number one, everybody does things for a reason. It may not be entirely rational. It may not make sense to you. But especially when it's coming from a different culture, pay attention, especially to the weird stuff, especially to the stuff that makes no sense. Because when you understand the stuff that makes no sense, then you're beginning to really understand this other culture a little bit. A little bit. So I began to figure out that they had only one governing narrative that talked about Brits and Americans. And that was the narrative of World War II, where Britain faced Hitler bravely on alone, and they were fighting the Battle of Britain, and America, through inertia, was just sitting there letting Britain fight their battles. And so somehow, when they met this new American, they had to organize their, their, their sensory experience into some kind of familiar story that made sense to them, and that's why I was pigeonholed the way I was. Beliefs, stories, narratives lead to behavior. That is an essential truth about culture. And, and, and the thing of it is, a lot of times these beliefs are so deeply embedded that most people of the culture can't even tell you what they are. I remember once going to a funeral in, uh, in, in Zambia, and I saw these guys... Uh, well, they, they did a number of things that I, I couldn't quite understand. First, there were a couple of guys that were running up and down a field with spears in their hands. They, now, don't get Africa and the Bantu people wrong. They, they don't carry spear, spears around. This is abnormal. So they must have had them hidden away some, somewhere, and they just brought them out for ceremonial occasions for funerals. They were kind of walking in a sort of a random way, and they were sort of, you know, thrusting their spears at the air. And I, I asked somebody, I said, you know, you know, Chiran Banshi, Chino Chobachita, what what does this mean? What are they doing? And the guy said, Me, Nchita, Nchianza Chesu. I don't know. That's our custom. <laughs> <laughs> so now now there's two possibilities, okay? Either he really didn't know, and it's sort of like uh, if somebody would see us throw rice or bird seed at weddings. You know, why, why do you do that? We would kind of go, in chita, in chianza chesu. I don't know, it's our custom. Or why do you have Christmas trees or, or things like that? I mean, you know, there's a lot of things that we can't really quite explain that we just do. It, it's the sort of thing that you do. Or maybe he didn't want to say anything to me because he knew I was a foreigner and a, a, a person that came from money scads of money compared to how much money he had. So I was in a power up and he was in a power down position. Is this making sense? Is my English making sense? So I was in a power up position. He was in a power down position. Why in all the world would you tell somebody in a power up position something that they're going to laugh at you about? You're, you're not going to do that. You hide it. So those are the two possibilities. Another thing that I couldn't figure it out is when the guy was finally put into the ground, uh, you know, there they, 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 there's no funeral directors or nothing. You know, the body's right there, and they put it right in the ground, and they pile the dirt on top of it, and they make sure that they pound all the dirt that was dug out of the hole into the hole again, 
and then they wash their hands, and it's a lot of water is going around. They wash all their implements, and nobody leaves the grave before they've done all that stuff. And then they start yelling at the guy in the grave saying things to him, you you left us too soon, you left us children bereft, you were orphans, we got nothing now, and now you've gone. What does that mean? See, often you ask questions like this of the hard stuff, and you don't know the answers, and maybe they don't know the answers, and they can't explain it to you. Anyway, get back to the Brits. Can can I go back there? Okay. Uh, Why did they do what they did? Well, I think some of the anger and the emotion... Because they had this narrative, okay, and that's the only way they could fit me into a narrative that made sense. The, the Battle of Britain, America dilatory in coming into the war, they fought on alone, brave Britain, blah, blah, blah. Um, um, Britain was losing its empire at this time. This is 1962. The winds of change were sweeping across Africa. Colony after colony was receiving its independence, not only in Africa, but in Indonesia, Malaysia, all kinds of places all over the globe. The British Empire, of which they used to say the sun never sets, well, now the sun was setting really pretty quickly, and everybody knew it. And guess whose star was rising? 1962? The American Empire. We don't like to think of ourselves, perhaps, as an empire, but we certainly were. Uh, We were a big deal. We spoke and the world listened, pretty much, if they weren't listening to the Russians or the Chinese or something like that. So we were on the rise, and they were on the fall. Even as a kid, you kind of realize that stuff is going on. So how do you feel about Americans? You don't like them. Why would you? You see what I'm saying? Culture at some level can make and has to make some kind of sense, even though those schoolboys probably could not have articulated what I just said to you. Because the most important part of culture to get at is worldview. Can I segue off to apologetics? Uh It's my belief that in apologetics, we often do something really stupid. We try to argue on the basis of, uh, oh, we try to come up with snappier arguments and sound smarter than the people that we're arguing with to sort of prove that Christianity is smart and okay. And, uh, you know, we're really not all that stupid. And God really isn't this big bully that just kills people willy-nilly in the Old Testament and does strange things in the New Testament. You, you know what I'm saying? So we think, we well, you can't beat up on my God like that. So we started to get in arguments with him. And uh, part of the problem is we're, we're not getting at them at a worldview level. It's an argument about, you know, my God is bigger than you're not God. Uh, I think it's important to try to understand where people are coming from, what energizes them, what are their hopes, what are their dreams, and that's really what culture is all about. It's learning to observe and to ask questions. You, you may not realize this, but I've sort of covered you know, the first page. So that was my PowerPoint, you see? It's gone. Click. Okay. Uh, now the second page is... Uh, how do you get at culture? If beliefs lead to behavior, and if you can't really get at beliefs, because sometimes beliefs are like the part of the iceberg that's underneath the surface that sucked the Titanic, and I don't even know why I brought in the Titanic, but you know, I, I just felt like bringing it in there. Uh, so how do you get at it? Well, you listen, you observe. And what are some of the things you listen for? You listen for things like the stories that shape their lives. So the British boy, Biggles, the, the British brave fighter who's fighting in his airplane, sh- uh, shooting down all the Messerschmitts 110s uh, in his Sopwith Camel. No, not the Sopwith Camel. It would have been his uh, uh, Spitfire. Yeah, Spitfire. Uh, that, that's how he's shooting them all down. Uh, what is life about? I don't care if you're an atheist or someone who believes in God. You, you do believe that life is about something. Maybe you believe it's about getting ahead. Maybe you believe it's about money. Maybe you believe it's about being smart or a success or something like that. Maybe you think it's about celebrity. But life has to have some kind of overarching meaning, doesn't it? And if you're witnessing to somebody for Christ, isn't it much more important to try to get out where they're coming from rather than to have a stupid, fruitless, doctrinal argument when, you know, 
Where's that going to go? There's going to be winners or losers, but you're probably not going to convert anybody by having an argument, right? So uh, my thought is try to find out what they think. What's life about? What is their material culture? America, guys like me don't get guys like you because our material culture is so different. You know, I, I, I grew up in the age of the transistor radio. I came back from Zambia, and I had this little radio that had a transistor in it. I could listen to AM radio on this transistor, and I held it up to my ears, and it sounded in a tinny speaker something that was really, really cool because I was listening to the Beatles, you know. We were just four guys, you know, in the cavern. And, and, you know, John, Paul, George, and Ringo, it was all a wonderful experience, you know. It was all great. So... Uh, Transistor radios, you guys don't even know what that is. Walkman, do you remember the Walkman with the big cassettes? Uh, Stranger Things, if you watch Stranger Things, you, you, you may have some idea of, uh, you know, the, the culture that my kids grew up in, but that still wasn't the culture I grew up in. Uh, 1995, boy, I thought it was a cutting-edge dude by uh, being one of the first guys in, in my age group to know anything about the Internet because I went to school in Madison. Uh, UW-Madison, and the internet was just coming on there along with postmodernism and all that groovy stuff. So, uh, man, that was just revelatory. I, 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 I can surf the web. <laughs> Who even thinks about that nowadays, you know? Yeah, I got, we, we got iPhones, we got all this instantaneous stuff, and for most of us, we're, we don't get it. It's so far ahead of us stuff that you grow up in and, and you're just used to it because it's part of the stuff in which you live, move, and have your being. Material culture is a big deal. And don't let anybody tell you that material culture, that, that culture or uh, artifacts are simply neutral. They have no impact on society. Can I tell you another story to prove that? Mm -hmm. Another quick story. Boy, I'm probably running out of time here. Gotta, oh, no, I, that's okay. I'm talking real fast then. It's sort of like the sitcoms, you know, they speed up the, yeah, yeah that, that's kind of what I'm doing. Um, all right, uh, if you go to some Minnesota towns on your way to New Ulm in Minnesota, I don't know why you'd want to do that, but uh, I, I, I go to <laughs> New Ulm, Minnesota <laughs> quite a bit. And uh, uh, so when I'm going there, you, you go through some of these towns like Janesville and Owatonna, you go through their, their long highways, just which are regular streets in the town, and you look at these huge Victorian mansions, and on all those mansions you see a broad porch. You notice that? Those big, broad porches. They don't build them like that anymore. They build decks out in the back, but they don't build big, broad porches facing the main street. Why not? Well, because those porches served a certain purpose in 1910, 1890, when all those houses were built. People of a Sunday afternoon used to just sit out there on the porch, we used to have a little lemonade or something like that, and passers-by would come calling. they say, we would come calling. Oh, how you doing, Hansons? Oh, yeah, we're doing pretty good. Yeah, it's not so bad. What's the weather like? Well, it's good, yeah. You know, stuff like that. And then they would have these wonderful interactions, face-to-face, -face, very cool society, very slow-paced. When did front porches become obsolete? Well, let's say you're a young man, and you would like to meet a young lady. What do you do? Well, you, you go walking with your parents, and you walk with them, and you say hi to Sally, who's sitting there on the front porch. Oh, you're looking especially nice today, Sally. Well, thank you, George. Are, are, are you with me? Okay. When did that all go away? The advent of the car. Huge. The impact that that one invention had, material culture, on society. So I can't even begin to imagine the kind of changes that you all are going to see with the accelerating, you know, if Moore's Law, even revised, is, is true at all, 
I can't even imagine the accelerating rate of change that you guys are going to live with given the accelerating rate of change I've had to live with. And quite frankly, I'm tired. You know, th this old brain can't handle all this new stuff. But you are living and moving and swimming in it, and you're going to have to get used to a lot more. And believe me, it's going to usher in outstanding, some good, some bad, changes. Technology just has a way of doing that. So material culture is a good thing to pay attention to. Why do the Africans build their villages, some huge villages where people live all close together, others a uh, little, you know, like almost family settings far apart from each other? It has to do with tribal culture, cultural differences. Uh, so I, mean, I could go on and on with examples. Attitude towards marriage in the family. Every society has some kind of regulation of the sexual impulse. I, I don't care who you are or, or where you come from. Every society has some kind of regulation uh, that provides for the safety and the, the future of children in some way. They've got to, otherwise they simply cease to exist. Uh, decision making. Uh, we in America tend to make many of our decisions as individuals because for us, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. You know, and so we like to make our decisions as individuals because I'm an American, you know, clinging to my religion and my guns and all that good stuff. So I, I'm not going to get political. No, that, that was not a political comment. I, I, I just, you know, sort of reflect the world that I see around me. Um, but decision making can also happen in a quite different way if you're in a rural society in Africa where the motto of the tribe is, I am as we are, we are as I am. So it's a collective that makes decisions. It's not to say that they don't have leaders, both men and women, they do. But the decisions and how they make decisions is quite a different deal than what happens often in America in our individualistic society, which gives one of our deep beliefs that it's about the individual. Unless, of course, you're a follower of Bernie Sanders, and then it's about this, you know, the social collective. Uh, the ideas come and go back and forth like fashions. Uh, what is the good life? That's a good question to have answered. All right, if you could have a magic wand and you could map out your life from here to, let's say, 45, and, of course, none of us wants to think at your age bad, past 45 because 45, you're teetering on the edge of death, let's face it. So, <laughs> I'm 64, so I can say that. I made it. Oh. <laughs> Across the Gulf. Oh, no, there's another. <laughs> so, uh, so, what is the good life? How do you define it? What do you want to have achieved by age 35 or whatever? What is your summum bonum, as the uh, Latin, the Romans used to say, your highest good? And then... Along with it, what is the problem? Because I don't care who you are. An atheist, a believer, you're in this society, you're in that society. Everybody believes that there's something wrong with the way things are. Maybe it's that we don't respect Mother Gaia. Could be. Maybe it's because man is a cancer on the planet and has been for a while, and that's why the seas are rising and uh, the, the globe is, is warming, and, and we got to do something about that. But there is a problem, and it has to be fixed. Now, if you're a Christian, of course, you believe the problem is sin, and you believe the answer is grace. But if you come from another culture, especially if you come from an unbelieving worldview, that's not how you're going to see things. Sin? What's that? We're moving from a shame, uh, from a sin-guilt society to a shame-honor society. Consider Weinstein. You know, that guy is toast. And he probably should be toast. But the point I'm making is that how do we make him toast? <laughs> we make him toast by pillorying him in public. That's what we do. It's not, in other words, that what he did was an evil offense against the Most High God who is going to hold him accountable for every act of using power illicitly, 
to sexually exploit people that were in vulnerable positions that he deserves really nothing but eternal damnation for, and he needs to repent. Have you heard that from any of the news organs? That's just not how it's defined. <laughs> That's not how we approach it. And if you don't recognize that there's a shift in language, the language that I spoke earlier might have been understandable in the 1920s in this good old U.S. of A., but it's not understandable anymore. So we got to figure out a way of getting people to that point. Are you still with me? Am I making a kind of sense? All right. So what is the problem? Now, I've been talking about a lot of problems. Let's try to see if we can bring it down to the, what the Bible has to say about this. And after I'm done, then I'll take your, your questions. Um, I mentioned earlier that when I was in Madison, I learned all about postmodernism. And what postmodernism did to me was really a number on my head because it took something that I firmly believed in, culture, and it exaggerated it. It seems to me that there's two problems when people talk about culture. The one is the Walt Disney version of culture. And you can probably sing it with me if you want. It's a small world after all. It's a small world after all. It's a small world after all. It's a small, small world. Um, that kind of diminishes the significance of culture. We're all the same after all. It's not that much different. If you just talk loudly enough to a person, even if he doesn't understand a word of English, eventually he'll get it. The British believed that for many years. <laughs> it didn't work then. It's not going to work now. So you try to make too little of culture, and that's not right. But the postmodernists have gone the other direction, and they treat culture as if it was a linguistic black hole. Is what I said just something that made sense? A linguistic black hole. That you cannot escape the architecture that your language gives to your mind. And because of that, the meanings that you attach to what's going on is culture-specific entirely. And it cannot really escape from one culture to another culture. So I can speak English and say, I am a human being. And I can say, Ndirimuntu, which is, I am a human being. But someone that's a postmodernist would say, it's not really the same thing. <laughs> Are you still kind of with me? So this is a problem that I think is caused by postmodernism, that they exaggerate the power of culture. What I'm trying to do with these, these um, documents here is to try to give you a biblical orientation that still allows you to say culture is a thing, but it's not the only thing. And there's other things that we need to think about from a perspective of revelation uh, and even natural science and natural law that are worth considering. So an anthrop anthropological a model of culture. I got this from my good friend Bill Kessel who studied uh, anthropology in the University of uh, Northern Arizona which was the place to study anthropology way back when. Um, he would say every human being is like all others. It's, here's where I am. Every human being is like some others. Every human being is utterly unique. Let's try like all others. There is a human commonality. Even when I'm talking to a woman in Africa who clearly grew up in a different society than the one I was born in, we are fellow human beings who occupy this same planet. When she talks to me, she's not talking to a dolphin. She's talking to another human being. There is such a thing as human commonality. Every human being is like some others. We do have tribes. We do have groupings where we have shared meanings within the circles of our tribes. Are you someone that believes in MSNBC? Are you a Fox News aficionado? Do you get all your news from, well, nobody gets their news from the Daily News anymore, but they used to. 
My kids used to get most of their news from uh, Jon Stewart. Uh, that was their worldview. That was their show they went to. That was their tribe. So every human being is like some others. And finally, every human being is unique. So it's probably a bad idea, having learned a little bit about, let's say, the Catholic tribe, to try out my newfound knowledge, which I got from a book on a newly minted Catholic that I just met, and say, well, you guys believe this. I don't believe that. No, you do. It says this in my book. Well, I'm sorry, but you're crazy. I don't believe that. See, that would be what we would call a stereotype. It may even be true that most Catholics do believe that in some general way, but it's also true that maybe some individual Catholics simply do not believe that at all. There's a differentiation to be found even within tribes is what I'm saying. Uh, how I would put it, it would be, there is transcendent truth. There are certain truths that the Bible says are common to all humanity. There is a sense of God, a moral sense, in every human being. Now, that's not to say that there aren't some card-carrying atheists who really believe that there is no God. But typically, they have to work to be atheists. Uh, generally speaking, what I've seen of the human race, everybody believes in some sort of God or some sort of supernatural. It's just natural for human beings to believe in some form of higher being, higher power that they owe some kind of allegiance or obedience to in some way. If nothing else, they believe in some kind of malevolent power that is going to wipe them out if they don't do the right thing. Sort of like on some of the episodes of Stranger Things that I'm watching right now where there's this kind of octopusy-like uh, beast that's, that's heading for this kid. And I... He shouldn't have listened to his stepdad to tell him, you know, just face it. That was a dumb thing. He should, I, you know, I knew it was wrong. <laughs> I knew it was wrong at the time, but he did it anyway. Um, so transcendent truth is the idea that there is natural law. And when I say natural law, I don't mean natural law the way most people use the term nowadays, which is really kind of a new way of talking about natural law. Most people, when they think about natural law today, they think of something like, well, whatever I feel must be natural. So they confuse one's feelings with nature. Uh, the concept of natural law is rather how God designed things to be, how God made things to work. Uh, in the beginning. And even if you were a Greek or a Roman, you believed that there was some sort of pan deity that sort of designed things to be in a certain way. And the more you lived in conformity with that design, the, the happier you would be, the, the vita be, beata, the happier life you would have, as opposed to someone that uh, opposed that natural law. So this isn't necessarily a Christian concept. It's, it's more of a universal concept is what I'm saying. Uh, so there is transcendent truth. Um, I never met an African who didn't believe that stealing was wrong. Uh, many Tonga people believed, had an easier conscience on sex than many of the missionaries did. That's true. But they did believe that marriage needed to be protected. So, are, 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 you know, it, they had a natural sense that certain things were right and certain things were wrong. And finally, there's tribal truth patterns of law, custom, belief, and activity that are distinct to each culture and ethnic group. Um, and, and this is the one that you want to get at, this tribal truth, when you're trying to witness to somebody else. Uh, you done on that? I, I, I'm almost done here, because I, I can tell I've, I've laid a lot of stuff on you, and I'm going to stop here and give you plenty of time uh, to ask questions. So here's... My best work yet. You may understand why I got C's in art in second grade. I, I don't understand why second grade teachers, why do you give people C's in art? Do you have any idea what that did to my self-esteem? It nearly destroyed it. Awful, awful. You get a big fat C, you know, and, and Timmy over there, he got an A. A jerk. <laughs> so... My, 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 my diagram to try to save us from the black hole of culture that I talked about earlier, that if I am trying to understand the scripture, I have to recognize, 
First of all, that the world of Scripture is really many cultures spread over millennia. So when I encounter Abraham, for example, I'm dealing with a so-called patriarchal age where people were pastoralists. They herded cattle. They moved from place to place. They were more like the Africans that I knew than uh, anybody in any urban center. When you're with King David, you're in a different place. Uh, when you're talking about Pharisees and Sadducees, uh, you're, you're in a different culture altogether. <laughs> so it, it's, it's embracing centuries of different cultures, and you've got to tune into that. Because if you want to understand what the words mean, you have to understand them on the terms of the times that they are depicting, right? That just makes sense. So you've got to tune into the world of Scripture, also correcting for your own biases because, you know, we all have filters. And I alluded to one of those filters before. You know, Americans are individualists. And so we tend to read out all the communal... I, I, oh, man, I don't have time for this, but I've I got to tell you this. I laughed at my dad once. I thought my dad was really nuts. I asked him, oh, you're going to give a paper at Synod. What's your paper going to be about, Dad? It's going to be our, our unity in Christ. Oh, that's the stupidest, most boring paper. I, I, I was a... I was a pistol of a kid. I, you know, I, I'm sure that uh, my dad regretted having me, but uh, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> so I, I laughed at him, and then he gave his paper. You should have seen the lineup of people that went up to him to personally shake his hand after they, they... It was the most electrifying paper. All the passages that talked about how we are all one in Christ and we are all unified. It just hit them right where they lived. Well, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, we filter out things. Americans see the individualist in the Bible. Africans who come from a communal tribal culture and a new society, a national society that has many tribes in one so-called nation that's really a concept drawn on a map around many different tribes, they are trying to seek some higher unity amongst all their different people groups. Are, are, are you kind of with me? So that's why this is going to be something that is electrifying to them because it hits them where they live, even though it doesn't hit me where they live. It's not that my dad was talking about stuff that wasn't there. It was always there. It's just I didn't see it because I had filters on. So you've got to correct for those filters as you're interpreting the Scriptures. And then you've got a third challenge as you're trying to reach this person who may be an atheist, who may have a different ideology than you. He may be a Republican. He may be a Republicrat. He may be nothing at all, apolitical. You know, whatever, whatever. You, you, you've got to try to reach him in a way that, doesn't, that causes more light than heat. To arise because isn't that one of our problems today? Uh, it seems like all the insulation has worn off the world and we're just sparking all over the place. We don't talk to each other. We, we, we yell at each other. We don't listen to understand. We listen to find words that we can use and turn around like arrows against our enemies and destroy them. Uh, rather than to try to listen with empathy and really understand the world as he or she presents that world to us to reach that full understanding. Not that we don't believe that the truth of Scripture isn't important, but so that we may speak that word in such a way that hits them where they live. Is this making a kind of sense? And the reason why we have a right to do that is we do have a common humanity that's what that circle, that smaller circle represents, the human commonality. We're not talking to dolphins. But even more, that our God revealed himself to us. Yeah, I will admit to any atheist, I, I approach the world with a crazy presupposition. See, I believe that the God who called the universe into being the one who names every one of the stars, who knows where everybody is, became a little baby in a manger, crying, helpless, needing his mother to wrap his little tiny limbs against the cold. I believe that baby is God of God, light of light, very God of very God. And he came into this world for me. 
to shoulder my burden, to carry my sadness, to take away my woe. And he did. And he beat the big one, death itself, in my place for me. See, I believe that. And I, I, I know that probably doesn't make any sense to you at all. And I totally get that. And I'm not saying you got to believe it. I'm, I'm just saying, when you talk to me, if you really want to understand where I'm coming from, that's kind of the sum and substance of it. But let's talk, and let me hear about your life and your experience. See, I'm, I'm hoping that won't create arguments. <laughs> what I'm doing is I'm testifying. I'm not arguing. I'm confessing. I'm not getting in somebody's face. That's the only way I've known that works in Zambia. That's the only way I've known that's worked in Salt Lake. That's the only way I know that works with me. Because if somebody comes at me full bore just trying to argue with me, oh, I love to argue. That's one of my favorite pastimes. But they'll never win me by argument because I'm always thinking of a better way to make them look stupid. God help me, that's true. I'm not proud of it. It's true. And that's hardly a way to evangelize somebody, is it? So I'm done. Your questions. You can ask me any question you want about culture, Bible, Romans, Bible interpretation, life in general. I wish to know the meaning of life, Father. Well, my son, life is like a beanstalk, isn't it? That's from Focal Harem in Held Twas I, second side of one of their first albums, Shine On Brightly. Check it out. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm not sure if you know the answer, but the, um, the culture around Jesus' time, was that at all, at least in, uh, like Jewish society, was that more individualistic like us, or is that more? Much more tribal, uh, is my read of it. The, the Greeks and the Romans were more individualistic, um, especially the Greeks. They, they almost, we got our ideas of individualism really from, from, from the Greeks. Uh, the, the Jews were much more uh, a rural society, and uh, they had their sects. It's not, they had their smaller tribes. They had the Essenes. Uh, the people from Qumran, probably. They had the Sadducees, who were the priestly caste in uh, the guys with all the power. Really, the chief priests are the power people, the money people. That's what you got to think of when you hear the chief priests. And then you had the Pharisees, who were sort of like the moral arbiters of society. Um, but they all kind of saw themselves ethnically as belonging uh, to the Jews. And their ethnicity was extremely important to them. The reason why they hated Paul is that he took something that they valued very highly, uh, both on the scale of religion and on the scale of their identity, which was their Jewish identity. That was both a religious identity and it was an ethnic identity. And he turned a, a plus into a zero. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew, you can still believe in Jesus, the Jew, and uh, we can have uh, these crazy Greeks who don't circumcise themselves as part of our group. <gasps> you mean I'm supposed to eat with that guy? I don't think so. You know, so it, it, it's that tribal thing that was definitely going on at the time. Well, Follow-up? Yeah, sure. Um, were they pretty much always tribal then, or is there any time that you think in the Old Testament that, like, Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Uh, consider the prayer of Solomon at the... Um, this is one of the <laughs> things my dad did when he got to the seminary. He, re he was an Old Testament prop, and he wrote uh, papers nobody ever reads anymore because, well, he's an old man, and now he's dead, so why do you care? I mean, a dead guy wrote. Uh, but what, what he used to do is read the uh, Old Testament from a perspective of where do you see signs of universalism in the Old Testament? It's clearly there in the institution of the temple. Uh, when you read Solomon's prayer in Second uh, Chronicles or in, uh, I think that would be First Kings, um, it, it's a parallel account. He talks about all nations coming. 
uh, when you hear the promises that were first made to Abraham, in you and in your seed will kol hamishpachot ha'aretz, all the uh, families, the tribes of the land be blessed, of the world be blessed. Um, so, if they hadn't got hung up on their ethnicity, they were to be a light for the Gentiles, as Isaiah said, that God meant through them to save all people. And he did, but not in the way they figured. They thought it, uh, that this idea of ethnicity was more important than it was. Does that make sense? Chester? Yeah, so you talked earlier about um, the, you know, the Asian cultures right now are more uh, shame Mm -hmm. um, I think we are too. I never hear the word sin anymore. What is the opposite? Sin and, sin and grace. Sin and grace is the opposite. Okay, so. Sin, guilt, sin, grace, sin, forgiveness. We talk about forgiveness, but forgiveness is more, as I hear people talking about it, is if somebody has done you a terrible injury, why give him power over your life? and make your life a misery, let it go. That, that's what I'm hearing when I hear the modern version, of the, the psychobabble version of forgiveness. I mean, there's a lot of truth in it. I'm not saying there's no truth in it, but it's not sin and grace as you find it in the Scriptures. What was it in the uh, in time of Jesus? Are you talking the New Testament? Both. Both? Both. Uh, they had, um, you know, clearly... They had a strong sense of lack of righteousness. They also had people that were very proud. You know, why did certain people like this, the best seats in a wedding that Jesus points out? You know, it's very much uh, shame-glory culture. Greeks were all about shame-glory. Um, I don't even think sin was a big deal for them. Uh, Romans were more moralistic but they were politically moralistic, uh, sort of like U.S. today. Uh, they would destroy their political enemies by saying, they're given to luxury. They live like Egyptians. They're always eating dainty foods. And who knows what they do on their islands? They're all getting up to all kinds of shenanigans. You know, it, 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 the, the, the kind of lur lurid stuff you read in Suetonius uh, most classicists would probably say, eh, not sure if all that stuff really happened. It could be a political way of making their enemies look really stupid. <laughs> I tend to be a little bit of a cynic, I guess. Um, what, just to give an example, like what, could you identify uh, something that causes a culture shift? Uh, for example, like, I know our generation... And it's true, but like like you said, we don't talk to each other. It's all texting and Facebook. And, um, could you name a couple of things that could spark a change like that? Because 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it wasn't like that. I, I think a lot of the change that's happening in American culture is driven by technology. Um, that's a biggie. But there, there's a lot of things that can influence it. Um, consider what happened to uh, the folks in, in Tenochtitlan, Mexico City, when they encountered these Spanish conquistadors, and suddenly life was different. They knew that a page had been turned. They didn't realize how radically it had been turned. So encounters with other cultures that have greater power than you can radically change your, your world order. Um, um, cultures can change by dying if they are impervious to change. Too little change uh, makes you like the Amish. Uh, you, you, you can continue to subsist for a while, but you will be kind of become an isolated subset, subculture of a larger culture. Uh, and eventually you'll die off. I think Wells is, is in danger of becoming like the Amish, um, quite frankly. 
Uh, on the other hand, too much change, and you, you lose coherence. The tribe can't stay together anymore because there are no more shared meanings. A, a tribe exists when, when there's a lot of implicit communication, like with a husband, with a wife. Uh, you don't have to spell everything out when you've been married uh, for 35 years as I've been married. You know, sometimes just a look or a glance or to say a word or something like that conveys a whole world of meaning. And that's because there's a lot of shared information that's implicit. Well, that's what makes tribes work. There's a lot of shared information that's implicit. Um, but when that goes away, be on, under the impact, the strain of, you know, it, it's sort of like a, a, a straw house under the onslaught of a terrible wind. You know, it'll stay up for a while, but after a while, those pieces of straw, pff, and before you know it, it'll lose all coherence. That, that, that is a way. So somewhere in between too much change and too little change, uh, an expanding envelope of experimentalism, uh, I think, is necessary for the survival of any culture. Uh, America, it's anybody's guess whether we're, we're embracing too much change or uh, we're trying to go back to some kind of former America that never really was, but a lot of people try to pretend that it was. Um, I, I really can't believe some of the uh, neo-Nazi uh, uh, white privilege stuff I'm seeing nowadays. I wouldn't believe that, but I guess I can understand it as a reaction to a sort of a blithe embracing of diversity as if it was just a, a value in and of itself that didn't have any threats concomitant with it. it, it does what I say make any sense? So, I mean, somewhere in between there, there's got to be uh, a, a reasonable uh, middle. What are some ways you think the wells can change to kind of stay attached to our, like, greater culture without giving up, um, like, scriptural um, foundation, integrity? Probably the key thing is to distinguish between principle and its application. Principle is one thing. Application is another thing. And, and the trouble is we don't bring the people that need to be a part of the conversation into some of those conversations. Um, one of the things uh, that my dad did, he, who was responsible for the ministerial education program in the Lutheran Church of Central Africa, was to have a senior pastoral theology class where basically it was a seminar. He and his students would talk about, okay, I've given you the principles, and I know you believe them. Now, how do you apply them in your situation? Let's have a seminar and talk about them. So I don't really know all the issues that you deal with. I think I would be presumptuous if I would say to you, this is what you got to do, this is what you got to do, this is what... I, I can talk about the principle... And then I can challenge you, let, let's talk about ways of applying that. Um, and I think through dialogue, as we come to a greater understanding of what the issues really are and how to take that principle and apply it to the current situation, uh, I, I, I think therein lies wisdom. So I, I think we could do it if, if we're just a little bit more open. And, and we need each other. Uh, one of the saddest things, and I'm not going to mention the congregation, but one of the saddest things that bothers me is when boomers um, think that church is all about them. And they kind of occupy pews and resist any kind of change simply because it's all about them. Now, I'm not saying that every change just per se is a good thing. Maybe they should be saying there's some of these things that I'm not so sure of, and people that are advocating should have respect for, for all the people. You know, so I, I'm not just saying, <laughs> let's do anything we want. But, but I am saying it really bugs me when boomers just say, oh, no, I don't like that. Uh, you know, syncopation is the tool of the devil. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've been to Africa. I know that's just not true. <laughs> Was I, did I answer your question? Yeah, pretty much. I just think it's interesting how I could go to Grace or I could go to St. Marcus or I could go home for the weekend to Richfield and there's all these different cultures but it's all the same. Um, yep. All the same like, concept. 
and 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 I'm not and I'm not bad mouthing a pastor in 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 um, in, in rural Wisconsin uh, either because there is a different culture. I mean, it's a different vibe than what you're dealing with at St. Mark is or what you're dealing with at Grace. If you tried to do at Grace uh, the things they do at St. Marcus or the church where I go to, uh, if we if we did some of the things at St. Marcus at uh, Garden Homes Lutheran Church, wouldn't work. Would not work. Grace, most certainly not. Uh, that's what I appreciate about Jim Tiefel, who is our current music guy on campus. He allows, he, he tries to get as many different things into the mix, not be, for the very reason that he wants to give a variety of experiences that people uh, can work with. It's been a privilege, and I think we should end this here because you all seem tired, and that's good. <laughs> yeah, that, that's my goal, you know, to tire people out. Did I, did I create, uh, one of the things I always test myself in any classroom situation, did I create the climate of fear and loathing that I usually try, strive for? <laughs> did I? Thank you, Chester. That's really what I was going for, um, because fear is important. Let's close with a prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the marvelous world that you have created and all the infinite variety that you have allowed to exist within it. We ask that you would help us to recognize that there is both your creative force for good and the satanic forces for evil in every good thing in this world. We ask that you would help us to embrace the good and to stand firm against the evil. Above all, we ask that you would protect us by the power of the name of Jesus Christ, the name by which he came and revealed to us your innermost heart and thought by dying for us on a lonely cross. Keep us in him as we live each day to give you glory. We ask this in his holy name. Amen. Thanks.